Hi, and welcome back to the Resilience Podcast. I'm Brad Hook, and I'm joined by Dr. Sven Hansen. Sven. Morning. Susan Scott said, our lives succeed or fail one conversation at a time in her book, Fierce Conversations. How can resilience practices help us succeed in our lives? Nice phrase. I'm a great fan of Susan Scott. I mean, I think she really was one of the pioneers in the whole concept of how to have a caring but an honest conversation. Brilliant book, by the way. Still very, very relevant. Yeah, I think that's a great challenge, and I think that's that's maybe what we look at. There is no question. If we go back to even our first episode where we talked about, you know, sometimes we feel really great, we're at the top of the spiral. Other times, not so much. You know, when you think about a marriage, or you think about a relationship with a child, or a relationship at work, or even a relationship in the traffic. When we're in a good state it's more likely to be successful, isn't it? And when we're in a bad state, it can really go pear-shaped and sometimes becomes unrecoverable, even to the point that you destroy a relationship or put yourself in jail. So really, really important. And you know, perhaps we could start the session, uh, and I'll read this just for those who are listening. There's a, um, you know, now quite famous Cherokee um, parable which goes like this, an old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight between two wolves. One is evil. He is angry, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false prize, pride, superiority, and ego. ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence. Empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. I think there's tremendous wisdom in this for all of us, Brad, is, is understanding that Sometimes that evil wolf uh, is very compelling. It's very easy to fall prey to it um, and to feel victim uh, to this. But there is another wolf and we can learn to train that good wolf. And uh, no, that's, that's in, a, in a nutshell what we're gonna go through. Mm, absolutely. So I thought what we might do is just look at reactions and, you know, this has been going on some time and it's based in that old yerkes dodson curve. So it's very old. It's very solid. We understand it. It's useful if we're going to solve the problem to understand what's going on. And much of the work being done in neurophysiology, psychology, neurobiology is saying if we can bring our consciousness to a situation, it's solvable. But if we can't, if we just act out of habit, if we're not aware of what we're doing, we can't solve it. So first thing we want to kind of understand is simply what's going on. So I'll, I'll work through this. You can call this a performance pressure curve. We also call it a react or respond to challenge. Think of it simply as life poses various challenges and, and we respond or react in different ways. And let's go through that. So let's say it is a morning, I had a rough night, and I'm on my way to work and it's a really relaxed day and there's no traffic because of lockdown. The challenge is low. I have a very relaxed drive and I listen to a good podcast. That's relaxation, All right? There are other times that driving may be a little bit challenging. You've got to get to a meeting quickly. You've got to avoid speed traps and you may have to drive with a whole lot of agility and caution at the same time. That will be quite engaging. There are other times where the traffic pushes against your need for speed and you start to become aroused. And this is generally what's called peak performance. It actually isn't, but it feels like you're amped up. And this is where you might make mistakes, go a little too fast and you get trapped. You know, perhaps bump that cyclist. And there are some times where you start to lose the capacity to deal with the traffic. And, you know, 
Hundreds of millions of people confront this every single morning and every single evening. They're late to get home, they're under pressure, and they feel distress after an hour in traffic. And then there comes a point, and it's called condition black, where our behavior can become outrageous. So remember, it starts calm, it escalates up, more attention, more skill, it becomes a little aroused, we start to feel distressed, pressure, our thinking is not as clear, and then three things can happen in condition black. The first generally for people is you have a flight response. You know, I'm never doing this again. And instead of staying the course down the path home, you duck off down a side road and you just run from the traffic. It'll probably take you much longer to get back. It's an example of flight. In a, react, in a, in a relationship, we might simply run out of the room, slam the door. That is flight built into our biology for hundreds of millions of years. Every reptile, every animal knows that under a certain amount of pressure or risk, there's a point at which flight is the best thing to do. Flight is driven by fear. Now, if you can't run away, you get angry, so you jump on the horn, you hoot, you make a noise, you fly the bird, you shout at people. Now you switch from flight to fight. And just as a snake can attack, now you feel angry, you're frustrated, you're irritable, your sympathetic system is really jacked up, your blood pressure is jacked up. It's a very dangerous place for you to be and you make some very, very bad decisions. But you can only sustain fight for so long. Eventually, you feel like, you know what, this is too much. It doesn't matter what I do, I can't move. And you give up. All right, you lose energy. You submit to the challenge, and as a snake would roll over and dead, sometimes as humans we may burst into tears or simply just withdraw into ourselves. All right, so that's how we think of this at the moment. In the beginning, we're relaxed, then we're challenged, and we wake up and we apply our skills, flow state, then we get pressured. We're going hard, but too tense on the wheel and performance starts to drop off. Your ability to fix an interaction or succeed in an interaction starts to fail. Then you're distressed, you're, you know, and it's mild. At this point, your mind has kicked off. The emotions are beginning to bubble. This is typically what we, we say, uh, feel when we say, I feel stressed, all right? There's a distress in your body. But the failure is when your behavior acts out in a way that never serves you. Does it make sense? Makes sense. And we think of this in, in, in some ways, you know, some of us struggle with procrastination. You could argue that as the load comes up, we suddenly start to think, oh, I just can't face all this. So instead of tackling the first challenge and getting it done, we kind of avoid, we procrastinate, we make excuses. And then as the things slowly block up, your anxiety and your fear stack up. Mm -hmm. And that in our modern world where there's so much going on can very easily become a chronic state where we're just endlessly anxious. And as, as in psychiatry, we call that a generalized anxiety disorder. Where there's inappropriate fear displayed in a situation. Right? And likewise, some of us become hostile or angry uh, over time. And if we don't resolve that, we can just start becoming chronically aggressive and attacking. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, if we don't resolve the, the freeze reaction, we have the risk of sadness, submission, loss of energy, possibly even depression. Yeah. All right, so to maybe just to group these so people can understand, remember the flight and the fight reactions are both sympathetic. In other words, they're adrenaline systems, noradrenaline in the brain. Really important to understand the flight reaction is fear-based. It's not chosen by your brain, right? This is chosen by the amygdala and the emotional circuits, the physical circuits of flight and fight, whereas fight is an anger reaction. So in an extreme case of flight, we panic and run. Uh, it may be a phobia, you know, just afraid of heights or afraid of snakes or spiders. Uh, it may just be a sense of fear. You know, people who step into each day afraid of COVID or climate change, whatever it might be. And then sometimes it just becomes a low-grade anxiety, just a discomfort of fear. 
And of course, it leads to self-doubt, which we know in resilience is a big problem. If you're someone who's more likely to go to the fight reaction, it's anger, rage and attack in extreme cases, down to frustration in a mild case. And it's a sense of, I've been violated. This is wrong. You should not have done that. Whereas the freeze reaction is a completely different system. Well, the sympathetic system runs down your spine. The vagus nerve is running down the front of your neck and through the chest and the abdomen. The old part of the vagus nerve triggers a submit reaction. So in an extreme case, we can collapse, faint, void bowels and bladder. You know, if we don't resolve the sadness and fatigue, it can lead to depression. And it gives a sense of we're overwhelmed by the challenge. Mm. Now, Deb Don and Stephen Porges, who are sit behind the polyvagal theory, uh, they argue that if we could just spend a little time looking at our interactions, where how am I getting triggered? Am I getting anxious? Am I getting angry? Am I submitting, collapsing under pressure? And if we can see this in retrospect, we can start to bring some skills into the interaction. But step one is to understand how you respond. And maybe to have a sense, look, yeah, that's interesting. I am, I mean, I have to admit, I'm, I tend towards flight reactions. You know, for me, that's a default path. So I need to step into each day, into each important interaction, conscious of that. There are other people who would be very quick to get angry. Mm. Quite a different experience for them and the other person. Um, and for that person, maybe they need to be really conscious of that and the countering, which will touch them in a moment. And of course, absolutely normal. And, you know, if we think about mental illness today, you know, anxiety disorder is number one. Depression is number two. And you could argue, argue that some of the conduct disorders uh, could well be fight react uh, related. Does that make sense, Brad? Makes Anything sense. You want to clarify there? Yeah, I was wondering, are there any times when fight, flight, freeze responses can actually serve us when they're good for us? Hmm. Yeah, you know, th this is this is probably a question many people ask. Um, there is absolutely no doubt they're in us because they've served us throughout our evolution. So nature retains anything that works. In other words, if this flight fright fees was working, you're going to breed and be around today. If it didn't work, you would have been eliminated. It's that simple. The problem we've got is these systems are very, very old. Now, perhaps in an extreme situation, let's say you chased it by the bear, should you run? <laughs> Most people will, but actually it's a very poor choice. Um, you know, one knows if you're working with animals, it is far better to protect your territory, stand, and in a way, to a calm resistance, you're much more likely to survive. Yeah. On the other hand, the freeze reaction could be uh, useful. I think the short answer is, Brad, maybe. You know, maybe in a severe abuse situation, maybe in an extreme natural disaster, maybe in an extreme um, war situation, sometimes I think that freeze response or even a flight response could be useful. Mm. I don't think the fight is because we make very bad decisions and we see very hazily when we look at the world through anger. But I think for most situations in our modern lives, there is no place for this. Mm, absolutely. I remember hearing on another podcast, someone mentioned that we're using outdated hardware, our bodies, if, if you will, in an upgraded environment. You know, we're working in such different ways. And instead of tigers and mm -hmm. bears, we're dealing mm -hmm. with emails and performance reviews and the 24 seven news cycle, which unfortunately for us, trigger those, those responses in our nervous system. So learning to manage that and understand that is really important. Yes. And I think the key here, you know, in the first part of this is just to be able to see it clearly. Mm -hmm. When we can make this conscious, we've got a chance in those important interactions. 
Yes. Because the problem is, you know, if you take an important relationship with a colleague at work, you know, if you run away or avoid tasks they send you, or you get angry and you shout and scream at them, or you burst into tears, it makes that relationship a difficult place to be. It's not going to be successful. You know, you put that into a relationship with a child or someone you love, it gets even more tricky. And, you know, it's in these extreme situations that you really see some terrible relationship breakdown. So the idea is a, is a comparison is, could we? There's the second question. First thing is, can we see what's going on? The second question is to ask the question, could I manage this differently? To be able to be so alert that you can see who this interaction could lead to failure. How might I possibly make it more successful? And what you see is, is two things. Uh, one, relationships are challenging. Two, this distress or the failure or the condition black we describe, it never serves us. We want to move in this direction. We want to work, move back to a better biological state. Out of this come two really important things we attend to. The first is you calm down. Your blood pressure drops, your heart rate drops, your breathing slows which means a whole lot of energy that was being wasted on that body hardware you described is now available for thinking again. The second component of, of what happens here is that when you fire the upper vagus nerve, that calming response, it opens your social engagement systems. So if it's a high challenging situation with that worker, colleague at work, it's much better to be A, calm, and B, open, connected to that person. And that really leads to, you know, what are the skills? And many people now talking about the vagus nerve, remember the longest nerve in the body, 10th cranial nerve. We've talked about this a number of times. Just reminding people the old vagus nerve is what causes the freeze reaction. The new vagus nerve comes from the ventral nucleus in the brain, and it can be myelinated. If we practice calm and connect, we get a stronger vagus nerve. And eventually, we no longer have to think about this. And, you know, if you want to think of a story, this is how I think of it. You know, the, the worst situation in an important interaction is to freeze. Burst into tears, collapse. Second worst, get angry, beat them up. Third worst, run away. The goal of the vagus nerve is to help us with the relaxation process, to come back to calm. When we come back to calm, resources are open to begin to trust, to respect, to feel safe. And that I think is the profound step that many people don't understand. You don't just relax for the sake of relaxation. You relax in order to bring the best of your mind, the best of your capabilities into play, all right? Now, when I trust someone, then I'm playful. Now I can push them a little bit. Now I can challenge. Now I can use a bit of humor. Now we can actually bounce when there are challenging situations together. It becomes more playful. I look forward to that relationship. I provoke energy and, and interest and diversity into that relationship. And that play, as we know with young animals, all species, is the foundation of performance, of survival, of thriving. Uh, so that, that's kind of the journey. And then if we drill it down to really practical, which is what this is all about, I think of it today as name it, tame it, and reframe it, which goes right back to the beginning. You've got to be conscious, you've got to calm, and then the reframe is to connect with a situation in a way that that interaction will be successful. So well, there's no question, we have to learn to sometimes zip it, particularly if you've had a bad day particularly if someone else is very upset. You know, there may be other factors going on. Be aware of, of kind of almost being alert to the fact that I am going to really listen today. When you feel the urge to interrupt, or you feel the urge to counter someone, just pause a little. That capacity to pause gives you the opportunity to name it. Because if I just jump in and interrupt, 
To be honest, usually my fight system is involved. It's too late. And that fight reaction is very quick, 0.3 of a second. So the ability to say, I feel like interrupting, but to say, uh, check, and then seek to name it. I'm feeling angry, I want to interrupt. Or I'm feeling anxious, I want to finish this meeting. Or I'm feeling, you know, I've collapsed in my chair. So restrain the reaction enough to say, I'm feeling X. So I'm feeling fear, anxious, I'm feeling angry, frustrated, I'm feeling sad, overwhelmed. The moment you name it, the prefrontal cortex is at your service. And the reptilian emotion system, that old hardware you describe, drops away. It loses blood flow. Yeah. Now you've got the capacity to really calm. So you name it, you tame it by exhaling, breathing. We've talked about this before. Giving yourself the opportunity to create space, lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, slower breathing, ready to put resources where they matter. Yeah. All right. So as you can tame the destructive emotion, then you need to step into the conversation, not repressed, but skillfully expressing, which has a few dimensions. So, you know, it's absolutely fine to say to someone, you know, the way you said that is making me feel really angry. But if you can say that respectfully and calmly, it'll really come across to the other person. And when you acknowledge to someone, look, I can understand you may be feeling a bit anxious about that. That is the essence of a powerful conversation. You're caring enough to want to know what another person's feeling and you're honest enough to tell the truth about what you're feeling. All right, so you think about it as, as engaging firmly with emotion, not denying it, you know, saying, I'm not angry. This doesn't help anybody. Uh, to be able to honestly confront it is good. And then the reframe is looking at, okay, and, and you know, here are some I use on a regular basis. I feel my anxiety, that is often my default. I've trained myself to think, okay, so what's interesting here? Where's there some learning? How, how might I see this in a different way? So from fear, I reframe towards curiosity. Yes. Very, very hard the first time you do it. Of course. But once you've done it several times a day for a few weeks in a row, you find it becomes natural. So now the feeling of anxiety or fear makes me curious. Hmm, what's going on here? Pay attention, Sven. Okay, it's a much more constructive way into those successful interactions. If I was an angry person, I'd be challenging myself to find respect, to see another human being at the other end, a person with, with feelings and with thoughts and with needs and family. You know, it may not be going all the way to kindness and compassion, but certainly in anger, the danger is we disrespect the other person. And then we do something that hurts them. And of course, for them, that experience is something really hard to recover from. Mm -hmm. So anger to respect, maybe even a bit of tolerance and kindness. And then the reframe for sadness. And look, to be honest, when you've you know, had a long period of sadness, it's hard to do this. But the reframe is, you know, when I feel sadness, I feel that lower energy to kind of say, okay, well, I am still here. I'm breathing sun may be shining there's something to work on you know and to almost use that feeling of loss as as to say look there are some good things happening which is very hard when you're feeling sad and here's an opportunity to learn let me really appreciate that and sometimes that means you know you may need to go and listen to some music you absolutely love a very powerful appreciation you hear a song that was important to you as a teenager you know, it you leap out of your sadness. So sometimes you need a few prompts with, with this. Absolutely. And I suppose you alluded to this, but emotions are like muscles in many ways. The more we use them and access them, the easier it becomes mm -hmm. over time. Key point. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed. And, you know, this is the beauty of the whole positive psychology movement, you know, and, and gee, say thank you to Martin Seligman and Barbara Fredrickson and many great people who've worked in this area, 
because what they've shown is that as, as academics, we've, we've gone almost 100 to one to the negative emotions. Mm-hmm. As a consequence, we have a world in which negative emotions have been exercised a lot. And that's where research focuses. What positive psychology is brought in is to say, actually, if you keep, keep exercising a negative emotion, it will get stronger. So for example, when I went through medicine, one of the modalities to deal with anger was to take a pillow and beat it up every day and pretend it was the person you didn't like. That's called venting. Well, if you vent your anger on a pillow like that, guess what's going to happen? You're going to, as you say, create a very strong, angry muscle. And the beauty of the work that they've done in positive psychology is to show actually there are countering emotions, the positive emotions. Mm -hmm. I think it's really useful to target the right one. So many people, when I say, what is the reframe on anger? They'll say, calm down. Okay, good. Let's take that. And then next time you see someone who's really angry, tell them to calm down and watch how well it works. Mm -hmm. It just makes it matter. All right, so, so we need to be skillful. And this is why, you know, the sense of respecting another person, a little bit of kindness of asking about, you know, how to actually improve the situation is the beginning of the opposite muscle to anger. Yes. Yeah, but I think it's dead right. The evidence of this is crystal clear. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson even suggests if you could find three positive emotions or more for every negative emotion you have, your life's going to improve. Up the spiral you go. Absolutely. Can everyone do this? Will it make me a boring person if I'm <laughs> constantly trying to reframe and n- not express my full you know, emotional spectrum? Tricky one to answer because, again, you know, I, I guess there's got to be a really common feeling that, that many of us have. Um, I don't think it'll make you boring. I think what's really boring, you know, is someone who around the water cooler, you hear, oh, she always just bursts into tears Mm. or she never confronts this or he'll just shout you down. That's boring, right? Because when you have repeated reactionary behaviors, flight, fight and freeze, it's really dull. You know, as soon as the intensity of a situation goes up, have a failed interaction. I think that's very boring. Now, I think you can express and feel your emotions. And I think that's why I say, you know, take my anxiety situation. It's really important I feel that anxiety, not denied. So to be able to say, hmm, interesting, it's cooking today, is a wonderfully aware state. I'm fully embracing it. I'm even, if you think, stepping into it. I'm consciously saying, oh, I'm in the anxiety pool right now. Okay, which way should I swim? Whereas if I don't know I'm there, well, it doesn't matter where you swim, it's gonna get worse. Whereas if you can identify the emotion, you can start to ask the question, where's the counter? When you push that reframe, so you name it, get in the pool with it, you tame it, drain the pool, And you think, okay, where to next? And you activate it. In fact, you don't become boring. You become creative. You become really interesting. Because now you can surprise people. You know, instead of just having your default reaction to a certain situation, you say, oh, that's really, that's that's hilarious, right? I wonder how we could look at this. Let's look at it from this way. Let's look at that. And you think, oh my gosh, that's quite unusual. Uh, people become curious and let me tell you at the end of the day if you have a couple of these freeze flight and fight reactions you will feel wiped out Mm. if you have a couple of interactions where you really are able to name tame and reframe you're going to come home and say you know what that was a good day i really enjoy working with x yeah so no i don't think you become boring and i think the final part of your question can everyone do it yes I think the important part of of that that particular part of your question, Brad, is some of us have developed very strong habits. Yes. And these habits have been so hard, not quite hardwired, but they talk about grooved. You've used the same circuits over and over and over and over again. So all you can think of 
you don't even think. Every time the, the energy of a situation goes up, you get angry. Boom, 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 boom. And that habit could be embedded over decades. That's why kids who watch aggressive, dysfunctional parents pick up those behaviors. So in that case, it's going to be hard work. Got to name it, be conscious. You got to tame it, step into the calm. And then you got to reframe the situation, which is not all about me. It's all about us, which mm -hmm. is that social engagement system. It's hard. It's a journey, but it's achievable by everyone with the right support. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. And with the outcomes being, I'm more playful, I'm more creative. The human part of my brain is online. Well, it's natural that we want to aspire to being in those states. Something that I, I remember we talked about a while ago was an emotion can last a few minutes, it can become a mood which lasts several hours. Eventually, down the track, this becomes our disposition or our temperament. Precisely. And we can unravel that. With, Absolutely. With deliberate practice. Yes, which makes you interesting and creative and as Susan Scott says, where we started, successful one interaction at a time. Makes a lot of sense. And I think if anyone wants to try this out, name it, tame it, reframe it, or choose which wolf you would like to feed over the next week, month for, for life. Yeah, powerful step. And I think, you know, this is the time to really work on this one. You know, if you could tell the story to your kid tonight, you will create a more conscious, more creative, more interesting young person. All right. So, you know, kids will lap this up. I think that lovely old Cherokee story is a, is a great start. Mm. It really is a helpful way to see it. Thank you, Brad. Thank you so much, Sven. Great session. And we look forward to seeing you all again in the next podcast. Fabulous. Thank you. You're welcome.